Okay. Um, hello, Zoom land. Hello, everybody in person. Sorry, we're, I'm a little frantic. We were solving some tech snafus, um, but I think everything's set up and ready to go. Uh, you will be able to see a couple of different screens. We're, we're putting a video of the class just so it feels a little bit more inclusive for folks on the webinar. And then there's like oh, what, eight, nine people in here in person. Um, the vibes are good. People are snacking. Um, so let's share. I can't say that. I'm not a former brewery owner. I can't say stuff like that. <laughs> um, sharing now. Sharing there. there okay. Go. There you go. So um, yeah, tonight we've got Dr. Mitch Green who's gonna to talk to you about uh, Green New Deal for Portland. Um, I'm gonna be over at this other computer kind of monitoring the chat. So um, he'll let you know his preferences for how he likes people to to interact. But yeah, I'm gonna to pass to, to Mitch and we'll have a go. Uh, thanks for having me, Nick, and good to see you guys in person and, and see you guys on the, the WebEx. Uh, I, I gave this talk a couple of years ago in a different, um, in a different time. Uh, and I'm always excited to kind of talk to this crew about Green New Deal economics. So let's get going on it. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me. Um, my name is Mitch Green. Uh, I do have a, you know, my sort of um, uh, secret shame is I have a PhD economist. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but it's okay. Not all economists, right? Some of us are good. Um, so I have a couple of affiliations on the slide. Uh, I'm a research scholar with the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. Um, I'm also a, a part-time instructor at Portland Community College. And I have a day job at a large federal power marketing agency in the region. You guys may know it. There's only one of them. Um, you can look that one up. And I do some other stuff in town. You guys might see me around town doing doing things in the public eye too. But um, but yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, climate stuff and economics. So the way that I kind of want to think through this stuff, um, and just before we get going, um, I tend to be like professory and long-winded, and I can sometimes forget how long I have been talking without taking a break. And so it's totally appropriate to raise your hand or just verbally interrupt me. Um, Nick will be monitoring the chat. And if, if someone does have a question, I think it's great to just stop me midway and ask the question. And then, you know, kind of, we'll do it like that. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, and so the way that I want to approach this is like, I'm going to assume that no one has had any economics training at all. Um, and so sometimes if I get a little jargony, uh, maybe, maybe Nick will say jargon giraffe, or something silly like that. And then I'll define the thing that I was uh, uh, taking for granted. And um, so, yeah, those are kind of like the, the ground rules here, I guess. Um, and so I wanna think, I wanna like lay out ways to think about this stuff for tonight. Uh, first, I wanna kind of spend a little time defining what I call the economic problem. Because I think when we do economics or we take an economics course, I mean, one of my former students is in here. Um, and uh, so, so you've heard this spiel before. But uh, you know, oftentimes folks think, oh, it's the market, oh, it's capitalism, or it's just you know, it's supply and demand, and that sort of takes for granted certain assumptions about what the economy is and we'll, who it's for and how it functions and so on and so forth. So I want to kind of spend a little time talking about different ways to think about the economy, uh, and then we'll get into this idea of like how to pay for this very big thing called the Green New Deal, right? Um, and then then I want to move us into uh, thinking creatively, like getting into kind of institutional design, getting into a little praxis and politics, because as I'm going to lay out, um, the economics of the Green New Deal are going to require a certain amount of like um, playing with new ideas and, and like pulling on some levers and, and, and kind of like saying no to some received wisdoms and, and saying yes to sort, sort of like pushing the envelope on some stuff. Um, and then I want to close out with talking a little bit about some contemporary debates like if you guys are kind of online a little bit in climate economics, you might, you know, interact with like degrowth versus like anti-degrowth folks. So I want to talk a little bit about that and and um, and try to square some circles on that. So let's get going. <clears throat> so what is the economic problem? So economics at its core is a social science. It's not a hard science. It's it's very much a contested social field. 
that is really concerned with um, really understanding how um, masses of people, institutions, so societies as a whole uh, solve kind of basic problems of production. Okay, how do we get our daily bread? Uh, and then distribution. So who gets what share? And then I think the critical piece, especially when we think about sustainability and like climate, um, like qualitative shifts, is this question of viability. Like, like can the economy sustain itself? Can it reproduce itself and grow or degrow, right? In, in different ways that that make us um, kind of make, make us whole as a species. Um, but usually when you encounter economics, it's much narrower in scope. It's it's like the definition gets narrower from that big think problem down to like just about markets. And so the narrow definition is like how do individuals make allocative decisions? So trade-offs, like choices on the margin, right? How do they how do they make those choices when you face scarce resources? Um, and I should have bolded scarce resources because that's like a hard assumption in, in standard economics. It's like everything's scarce. We live in a kind of like um Worst case scenario, and like the best we can do is just kind of bargain with each other. Um, and then, you know, when we've got like this seemingly boundless set of wants, right? So that's like the textbook definition. And I'm going to say that that's, that's really not, um, not what we need, and we need to move past that. And so I'll lay out just a little bit what that definition looks like. So we sometimes call it, well, we call it neoclassical economics, which is the kind of mainstream standard approach. Um, and it really is like defined by its own method. So it takes the problems of the, it takes the economic problems, which is a big like production distribution viability question. And then it shoves it in a little box over here and it puts it in that box because it only understands certain methods, right? Um, and those methods are sort of like, you start with resources and technology as given, all right? There's only so many kind of like, um, you know, manna from heaven over here. Uh, it is scarce. There's so, like, the set of technology is given. And so then you assume that given that endowment, for lack of a better word, um, that you have these rational agents that are like selfish. And I put quotes around rational because it's not rationality in the way that we use it common, in, in a common sense way. Like rationality has not necessarily a negative connotation. Like I'm making reasonable decisions. Um, for economics, uh, rational means something very specific. It's like, I'm, I'm a little bit selfish. I'm motivated by individual utility maximization. And so, and I'm going to be sort of guided by the guardrails or like the fact that other people are doing the same thing, right? Um, and so you give them those rules and then they kind of operate like little robots, little automatons and kind of like maximize their own welfare and, and, and utility. Uh, and so they make that kind of trade-off uh, against this scarce world. And so if you step back from this definition, you say, all right, well, mathematically or logically, um, analytically, this seems like a, a reasonable way to understand a model of a market, right? In, in a capitalist system. But again, I'm saying that that's, that's a subset of the way to think about the economic problem. So if we're gonna talk about sustainability economics and climate change, which really just sort of engenders a big qualitative shift in the way that we uh, organize our, our world, um, then we have to recognize that that's only one way to look at it, okay? <clears throat> and I'm, I'm saying it's actually bad. Right. Um, so it sort of misidentifies the economic problem because um, it, again, is it's it's sort of only equipped. And I don't want to pick on it too much because like it has some value um, and even heterodox economists use those methods. Right. To kind of come up with like uh, ways to study the economy and the world around us. But but it is really just only good at analyzing what we call welfare. Like, are we better or worse off given that set of received uh, technology and receive resources. Like it, it really is not very good at sort of understanding how we can transition to a different type of economic system. Okay. So I don't think that we should use the neoclassical frame to evaluate Green New Deal economics. And I'm going to get like, here's the jargon giraffe. I'm going to like, I'm going to put that on me because I put it in the slide. Ontological considerations. What does he mean? Um, what I'm saying here are there, there's sort of like, three different domains of existence that social scientists oftentimes think about. You know, there's the ecology, there's society, and then there's economics. And I think in the kind of mainstream approach, there's a tendency to see economics as outside of society or outside of the ecology as if these are different domains of problems, right? And what I'm gonna suggest here is that you need to take kind of an interconnected or embedded approach where you say, look, 
the model is really that the economy is embedded in society, right? Um, and society is embedded in this ecological system. So, so is anyone familiar with like uh, donut economics or any of that kind of like that uh, any ecological economics stuff where we talk about like kind of a um, a kind of bounded world where we have to like live within a certain set of constraints because we have these ecological interactions. This is what this chart kind of gets to at a very abstract level is to say that we can't really think about the economy or even society as being disembedded or outside of each other. The problems that we create for our economy are problems for society and vice versa. <clears throat> and those interactions on a socioeconomic level create problems for our ecological system and vice versa. So that's the way that I, um, that I think we need to be thinking about this in a broad frame. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say here on this is, is that um, history and institutions are really important if you're gonna do this kind of analysis. So what, what kind of creates our, our economic setup and what enables a transition to another system are, are problems of institutions. So if you haven't figured it out already, I'm a trained institutional economist. That's my background. So when I did my PhD, I went to uh, like one of three schools that still does this uh, in economics and you know, a bunch of institutional economists saying, look, the math is fine. We're gonna use the methods. We'll teach you how to do econometrics. That's all well and good but you're gonna read history and you're gonna read some interdis in, uh, interdisciplinary stuff and, and really try to understand how institutions kind of both constrain and, 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 um, and make new possibilities for our society. So, so if we step back and we restate all of this, um, then economics, I, I would say, is what I like to call a social provisioning process. So I bolded that term in, in the wall of text there, but it's really, you know, how do we organize our institutions to ensure that we we have a sustainable economic life process or social provisioning process. So we kind of really intentionally put the economy back in the social and say, it's not about extraction. It's not about trade. It's not about exchange. It's about provision. So it's almost in, in a sense it evokes a kind of like nurturing theme or a, um, a resource maintenance theme or a care theme, right? So if you have a social provisioning process as your definition, for an economic system, then you can start to talk about, am I in a violence economy or am I in a care economy? And that's, I think, the, the entry point that we have to have for, for Green New Deal economics. How am I doing the chat? Am I, am I, uh, we have any issues here? I feel, I feel caffeinated, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's take it back. So if you're talking about ecology, and I would appreciate a definition of that. And I, based on your context, I'm sort of interpreting it as the environment mm -hmm. with its competitive sources. Is that correct? It's a, I'm glad you asked the question because uh, I didn't really have like a whole thing in the slide here. Um, so when I talk about the ecology, <clears throat> I'm kind of drawing a difference between sort of like environmental studies or even environmental economics. And I'm moving into a world where I'm, I'm saying ecologists or ecological economists are actually interested in like understanding the web of life, understanding kind of like how all the little, you know, flora and fauna and environmental aspects are constructed almost as if like a, a big network, right? And so like you can have like a, let's talk about like a, um, let's talk about natural gas for a second, right? So when we produce natural gas, we, we drill into the earth, we pull it out, and that ecological system is creating a resource, by, and it enables that, but it, and that's a source, but it then it, produce, it produces a sort of cycle of waste as well. And so there's this idea that we've got this intentional mapping of the sources and sinks of our resources and wastes. And, and then from there, you can talk about things like, well, what is the material and energy throughput of that, of that setup? And is it causing um, a situation where we degrade and undermine kind of like different regions of that web? So it's kind of a very holistic and did I do that? Yeah, and I would also add, um, you know, in like the world of ecological economics, there's a lot of emphasis on like um, reproduction of life yeah. and resources. So, and I think economists think about this too, but uh, especially Marxists, but, the idea that like every year, like 
the grass of like a perennial plant, an annual plant will grow, right? And it grows because there's like soil nutrients and like you throw fertilizer, you do all these things and it grows, right? Some other things grow on different cycles. There are things like water cycles that are, are like bring water at certain times of the year. And the, the ecology broadly is like all of those forces at play together. Uh, and the economy from like a, like a neoclassical way of thinking about it doesn't think about any of that. It's just like, it doesn't care that, to use the example that they said that gas takes, you know, like millions of years of like, you know, dead fossil matter being all like pressed together geologically. It's just like, that's a resource. We yeah. can use it for a mechanical process and like sell it as a commodity. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this very narrow view of that same issue. Yeah, for sure. And like, if I were to, take it back just a couple to kind of highlight a choice here uh the reason i put viability as like the last word in the slide is um to nick's point about the sort of web of life cycle and this this idea of like an ongoing cycle of reproduction and and growth or change really because because growth doesn't always have to be me, mean getting bigger it could just mean things get different um what viability for economists means is that do we have in collective all of the right setups and all of our different production processes to make sure that we're producing enough seed corn for the next round of production, right? And so you could you could apply that broadly to things like, um, I'll use an example for like preschool for all. Um, you know, right now there's a scarcity on providers, right? Because we didn't develop and nurture and cultivate that resource of a labor pool for a really long time. And so this idea that, well, it's, you know, it's not ramping up as fast as we want, let's pump the brakes or cut the tax, that would undermine the viability of that new type of care economy that we're trying to create. And so there's this idea of, a, of an ongoing kind of resource maintenance thing, which I talk a little bit more about in, in the slides, but it's a really good question now. All right, so I've got, a def I've got kind of a definition here and I wanna highlight the importance of institutions because it's, I think, we're at a critical moment in, in all of this, um, this organizing, you know, cause like climate change economics, Green New Deal economics is not something you leave to the economists. Okay. And I say this as an economist, you can't trust us. Um, first against the wall, so to speak, but uh, it, it's an organizer's problem. It is an advocacy problem and it's a political problem. And so the way that you approach big qualitative shifts in the economy is through institutional change. OK, so so um, there's this this economist here, John Commons, and he sort of he said, like, if we're going to do economics, we should think. And he's really old. So he didn't care about the, the environment at this point in time. But um, but he he had it right. He said, look, institutions are basically arrangements of, of, of you know, the way we control individual action or the way we liberate individual action or we expand individual action. So it's a it's a way of like articulating this idea that people come together and do stuff in politics and cooperation. And, and, and what it does is it has three properties on the way that we interact as free individuals. It controls us, but it also liberates us. And it might ex expand us and make us more powerful through collective action. And so it kind of like allows us to think through like the tension between individual structure and agency, if you want to get heady with it. Um, but it centers it back on this idea that we can do stuff. Like we don't have to just sort of sit back and hope the market delivers the good someday and hopefully you know you, you vote every four years for president right um you know hopefully you're going to vote in the next city council election uh wink wink nod nod but uh you but you can be engaged and you can actually do something to change your institutions through collective action and if you're studying law and you like economics i, I put this little plug down here that um that the institutional economics approach has come back in a really good way through the law and political economy movement, which comes out of the critical legal tradition. Yeah. Just to put a fine point on this. Um, Can folks on the Zoom hear Nick? So the um, the question around like institutions and who designed them, where did they come from, who do they work for, is really similar to the question of like resource use and economics, where like the social relations, the history are largely hidden from us. And they're just sort of like assumed to be natural because most of our institutions we kind of just like inherited, you know, even probably the youngest folks here 
only like real new institutions we've seen are like social media and Twitter and stuff like that in our lifetime. Um, but they all have a history. Um, so, for example, mm -hmm. the police have a history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and so we can then extend this and we say, well, actually, all economic activity is institutional in nature. So it, like economic activity is like a set of instituted processes. So um, you can think about institutions as being formal or informal, like uh, the Federal Reserve. That's a formal institution. I, it has a building that's actually 12 buildings and I can go name them and point out, I could put my hands on it. And like, this is a thing uh, you can see, you know, if you pull out a dollar bill, it'll say Federal Reserve Bank note on there. That's a formal institution, but institutions don't have to be formal to be powerful or impactful. Um, this idea that there's no alternative to like running a balanced budget and doing austerity economics is an informal institution. It's just a shared set of collective beliefs. That's like, oh, we, we, we can't do any better than this. You know, there's no alternative. Um, the planet's warming. There's nothing we can do about it. Maybe if we get the prices right someday, you know, <laughs> the market will get us there. Uh, but, but, but we can't take action. That's an informal institution. Um, money, you know, sort of like the thing that we use to kind of like weave all this stuff together, uh, the kind of plumbing, so to speak, of the financial system, of, of the economic system is both formal and informal, right? And uh, how we think about that's gonna be pretty crucial. And so when we think about institutional change and we think about institutions as like things that constrain us or liberate us or expand our opportunities as, as individuals, uh, we can also think about them as like habits of thought, you know, it's it's our collective shared ways of of knowing, doing and believing. And it creates that kind of nexus of ceremonial values and beliefs. And so to do a different type of economic system, in some sense, you have to you have to change your habits of thought and you have to kind of refactor a little bit on what your objective functions are for the economy. Because at the end of the day, the economic system is going to produce the resources that reflect its institutions, right? So a violent economy, because so I'll keep using this metaphor, is going to generate a lot of prisons. It's going to generate a lot of walls at borders. It's going to generate a lot of like conflagrations and climate, you know, disasters and, and, and crises. Um, a care economy is going to generate um, universal pre-care. It's going to generate, um, you know, sustainable energy systems and it's going to generate uh you know uh housing that's that's affordable and you know free at point of service for you know in the ideal state right so so you can kind of bucket these two things and it's only possible to to describe those two different types of thinking um by um understanding how the institutions that undergird it have to be quite different and then we can you know get into sort of like the political economy of all that um, but you get where I'm going. Um, and so a little bit of a uh, technical term, the Lockean tradition, what do I mean by this? It's like, that's John Locke, it's the basis of common law. Um, I, I say this only in the sense that like, that's pretty embedded in this idea of the market as being economics, right? Uh, that there's sort of this like, there's, in, there's this inevitability towards um, kind of natural law conceptions of, of, of resource allocation and, and production. Uh, and so in a sense that closes politics, that closes economics uh, and, and narrows what we can think about as um, community resource. Like it, it sort of rules out things like community resources. It rules out things like uh, forms of shared governance that have different politics uh, that are apart from say, just to adjudicating property claims in court. Um, which is a big deal if you're thinking about like later I talk a little bit about regulation and how, how that matters for like changing our, our kind of energy system. And, you know, you got to deal with locking and property law a little bit if you're going to think about regulatory takings or, or kind of using the right of the franchise to say you can't do this anymore, you're going to do that now. You know, that, that, that gets into that tension. And to be able to enable that kind of stuff, you have to say, well, the institutions are not inevitable. We didn't just get one type handed down from God right? We built this at some previous generation. We can change it through organizing, through, through, uh, through, through you know, through political struggle, right? <clears throat> okay. So now, so with that kind of in place here, I want us to think a little bit about resources because the Green New Deal is a statement about resources. Uh, an economic system is a statement about resources. Um, and so we kind of think, we need to think about what this means. 
Um, so I said early on, like the narrow definition of economics that I don't like is this one that kind of says, well, resources are scarce, right? There's only so much to go around. But what does that mean? Like, does that mean there's an initial datum of resources that exist just at the point of creation or, you know, written history or whatever? No, um, resources are kind of the product of human interaction with the ecological world and our, and our social institutions. Um, the classic case that we use in like economic history is the fact that like at one point in time prior to the production or the invention and application of like the, um, of the water drilling well technology to, to oil production, whale oil was a resource. And then we figured out how to pull petroleum out of the ground and turn it into oil. And now whale oil is not a resource. It doesn't even matter. It's irrelevant. And so there's this idea that resources are not, they don't just exist, they become. And they become based upon the way that we uh, engage with our joint stock of knowledge uh, and our institutions, right? Um, and so, thinking through like kind of that that interconnectedness and that contingency on our politics and and kind of what we're willing to kind of apply in a technological sense to the to the economic system, then we can start to think about resources not as just not as like this thing I found you know over here or I'm just gonna like take take this and put it in my bag now that's a resource like it's not about collecting stuff off the ground or digging it up out of the ground or plucking it off a tree it's about supply chains it's about sets like chains of production where human labor is applied with technology to produce a set of goods right and that can be extractive for sure but it, all, it can also be like renewing can also be generative uh, we want to think about them as like these interconnected chains of productivity and waste so waste and productivity are neutral terms in a certain sense. You have to apply a value statement. You have to measure them for them to become problematic, right? Um, but you can't say, I mean, there's no world in which you say, we figured out a way to produce no waste. It doesn't exist. It violates the second law of thermodynamics. Every, every change in a chemical structure or a material structure produces waste. There's no avoiding that. So our task is like ecological thinkers as Green New Deal planners, and agitators is like is design how do we design value chains or supply chains that minimize waste that minimize energy throughput um and so if we think about resource resources as this thing that we kind of curate um nurture produce we can also say that we don't have to cling to them forever like a resource can be relevant for a point in time in a transition and then you can turn it off and you can switch to something else that's more conducive to the next stage of development. Um, so there's, you know, at the last last bit of slides, I talk a little bit about the, about the degrowth and like the um, tension with like the supply side progressive slash like industrial policy uh, geeks. And um, there are good points made on both sides, you know. Uh, but but the point that the industrial policy planners have is like to get to a rapid Green New Deal state, we might not have to sustain some some problematic technologies right now to, to, to enable the productivity to, to scale. Right. So there there's, that's a controversial claim, but that's, that's an active debate that's happening. And that's what I mean here by like intentional sunsetting. We can be even more like practical and local and deliberate about this. And I can name it. I can say, well, you know, the critical energy infrastructure hub has resources that we would like to intentionally sunset. Like right now, let's do that very fast. And let's like throw our resources at it to kind of, you know, get Zenith out of there and, and find a different place for these tanks. But that doesn't mean we like, we're like not gonna have fuel tomorrow. I mean, you can still get gasoline delivered to, to, to a pumping station. It just changes the cost structure, just changes the kind of productivity piece. But there are ways to take intentional action to sunset resources, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm like, I'm thinking very specifically about oil trains running through through Portland um like we do live right now in a world where people still need cars and we still need to burn fossil fuels like you can't flip that switch today and then have it have that resource be um irrelevant tomorrow but we don't need it to be cited there and we don't need that to go through our neighborhoods now um and in fact the longer we tolerate that the more entrenched it becomes and so there's this sort of sense that like um, we can do a couple things simultaneously. One is like 
push hard to kind of invest in the alternatives that we need to, to transition us off of that of that system while accepting maybe that there might be a need to kind of raise our costs associated with that to, to consume it in, in, in the near term. That's kind of what I mean by by that. Um, the natural gas system. So yeah. There's another one where, and I'll just kind of just sort of be lead here, but yeah. the system around like piping fossil molecules into a home is like pretty recent in human history. And, um, you know, some places wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to like flip it off tomorrow, but there are already technologies that are really efficient for producing heat during cold winters, like a heat pump. Yeah. Um, is what it's called, which is an unfortunate name because it also cools. Um, but they're like Scandinavian <laughs> countries that are yeah. installing heat pumps that are workable in like minus 40 degrees, right? And mm -hmm. as long as your electric system doesn't go down or you have like battery backup, those are things that like could like obviate the need to pump carbon molecules into your home. I'm, I'm going to go back just a second because I think, where, where did I talk about waste? There it is. Um, that makes me think about hydrogen for a second, um, because it's a really good example. So um, when we talk about like this, ch this changing nature of resource chains, and like I said, like, we want to think about it in terms of degrees of productivity and waste. Um, one of the cool things you can do with like hydrogen is you can say, well, we can take advantage of like the big regional pipelines that natural gas is used to plumb. And like, you can kind of upgrade those to tr uh, transmit hydrogen, but you wouldn't want to bring that all the way into the house. Cause that's, that's neat. One, it's dangerous, but two, it's not necessary, right? You, you can just do like ductless heat pumps, right? Um, but you can still have a hydrogen plant or a hydrogen kind of hub as a mechanism to take surplus energy off the grid uh, when the wind is blowing more than you need it to blow or the sun's, you know, we're in oversupply conditions, you can turn it into long duration storage. Then you can use it as a generating resource to like balance the grid. Um, and then the waste from that, all that can be used as district heating. So there's ways to kind of refactor all this to make it um, a system that is very different than what we have, but it's still kind of like, it feeds off the breadcrumbs of our existing infrastructure. So it's not like you're not totally wasting past capital investments and you're not totally wasting existing infrastructure. You're saying we're going to make this big jump over here to a new type of energy provisioning process. And when we do it, we're going to be really deliberate about like getting every last bit of, of efficiency out of that. Um, so just kind of like broad ways of thinking about that. Um, I know I can be a little abstract about this. So I appreciate the questions that, that make it concrete. Uh, yeah. When you when you say that there's waste and that even in like a regenerative economy there's always going to be that output, um, are you saying that there, there's always going to be the what you call the sunset resources in that waste pool, or like how else could you define that what that waste is? Yeah, let me. The question. Oh yeah, so um, for folks on the on the Zoom, the question was, can I say a little bit more about um, the relationship between sunsetting of resources? And this claim that there's always going to be waste in the in the kind of economic system is that is that a fair characterization? Uh, yeah. So what I mean when I say there's always going to be waste is when you when you consume when you use energy and transform it from one kind of state to another, you lose some of it to heat. And you lose some of it to like now it's a new compound or molecule that you can't like use again, right? It becomes kind of like waste either through thermal, like it's just lost to the atmosphere or it's, or it just goes in the ground and becomes something different and maybe not usable, or maybe it's like toxic. Um, and so even in the best type of design, you, you have that because there's like this, this fundamental rule of physics where, um, some of that, some of that gets lost, right? Every time it's entropy, right. Is, is the term for it. Um, and so what I mean by like refactoring and kind of like doing sunsetting of existing technological resources is it's almost like a sort of like you check in as a society and say, how are we doing on our material throughput system? Oh, it's not really, it's not great. It sucks. This was a, this, we, this was a good idea at the time, but the conditions have changed. Now we've got a wasteful system relative to some new technology that could maybe make better use of our, 
of our resources and our energy and make us more sustainable. So there's this idea where you don't get locked into the past because you just did it. You, you made the investment, it paid for itself, and you're you're kind of falling afoul of the economist fallacy, which is like economist fallacy, which which says, you know, you're throwing good money after bad. Like I, I did this thing in the past. Now I need to stick to it. You can always just change and say, we're going to make a new investment and we're going to sunset and render old resources as, as no longer being suited for the task. Maybe like um, an ecological example would be like, if you don't allow soil to generate through like agricultural cycles, then they just, you can either like destroy the soil altogether and it's not usable at all. Um, but if you were to like change the rotation of crops around and like intentionally plant things that are going to fix nitrogen and bring resources, like you would still have waste because still there's chemical reactions and you're using stuff, but like on the human time scale that we're working on, it's like becomes basically like a renewable resource. Yeah. And that's that's actually a term you haven't used yet either, like around like renewables and like non-renewable resources, because those are important in this world as well. Like some things are renewable, like plant cycles and um, um, solar, sun and yeah. air. And then some things we have materials that we only actually have so much of, and once they're gone, they're actually not usable for us anymore. Yeah. It, it seems like we get to define what a waste is. So we define what a weed is, and weeds is the same thing we don't want somewhere else. Nuclear, for instance, yeah, there's no waste. There's just something we can't use. But there is some new technology about reusing nuclear waste as well. So I think the concept of waste is, we define what the concept of waste is, is that? Well, I think I I know you're going with this, but I but I I am using a very specifically ecological definition, which is just like it can't be used again as as an energy source. Like it's just gone. Um, but nuclear but, waste was gone until I, I think somebody I read something about right. like reusing nuclear waste. Yeah. So so the tech so when technology changes, yeah, it changes it, that relative uh, proportion of waste, right? So you, so there's there's so, like, so. yeah exactly. Um, but yeah, so it's really about, it's just a process of like updating your priors, updating your institutions to be fit for your new technological system, your, your, the state of the ecology and, and, and always keeping kind of an eye to the future. Like we, we are, we are planning for a sustainable future, um, which is inherently non-market in a sense, right. Or at least the market, if it's part of it, it's probably always going to be there in some fashion. It's just not leading. It's not, it's not in the driver's seat. It's there to kind of help the, it's an institution just like the others. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I looked at the slide and it says what you're, you're getting at, Nat. Um, so new tech can render some resources obsolete. It can also enable new resources, right? Um, but I think the other big thing is like, if you got this view on it, it undermines that relative scarcity argument. So it also means like, well, we don't have to fight for crumbs necessarily on, on a fixed pie we can also grow the pie by changing the way that our economy is structured so this gets a little bit more into the political economy distributional aspects but we don't have to kind of accept that there's a limited quantum of money for instance or a limited quantum of like of of administrative capability to go out and and kind of like you know change our society we can just invest in them and cultivate them like and i, I keep coming back to preschool for all because i think the claim was always well you, you just can't, you just can't guarantee early childhood education to families. Like we don't have, we can't afford it and there's no resources. Like, no, you can't and you can build it. Um, okay. And then like scarcity is, scar scarcity is like as a constraint in a model as a sort of organizing principle is still important. I'm not like doing Looney Tune e economics here. I'm still an economist at the end of the day. I need a constraint to do the model, but my constraint is minimizing material throughput okay and minimizing entropic waste so we want to make sure that our activities don't draw down the stock of nature right and that's what that's what we do when we you know we when you clear cut a forest and that's what you do when you kind of like let a bunch of toxic waste flow into your river system or you mine fossil fuels out of the ground you're basically not living within your current solar budget or an ecological budget you're 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 drawing down past resources and turning them into massive amounts of wastes, which then spoils spoils that system going forward. So, so our our 
organizing constraint is still just the 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 the, the goal of minimizing that uh, that throughput and waste. Okay, so how do you pay for all this? All right, it's probably what you guys thought you were signing up for, but um, we're already like 30, 40 minutes into the talk. But but I mean, I think you can't really ask that question until you've laid out what our capabilities are and how institutions can change our resources, because that's really, that's how you pay for it. So um, when we think about the Green New Deal, it's gonna be expensive in dollars. It, it, there's no question. Even the, the the budget version, like the, oh, we've got McDonald's at home version of the Green New Deal was the Build Back Better plan for a couple of years that failed. And that was only $2 trillion, right? And that was not even close to what we need. Um, right. Uh, but these days, what's $2 trillion between friends, right? Um, it's really not that much money for 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 the problem and and for the size of the uh, of the economy that we have. But but you know, estimates for the Green New Deal, Green New Deal run from like 16 trillion, 93 trillion dollars. I've seen that number before. Uh, is it more? And I'm just telling you that none of these numbers are correct. Like there's no there's no right number for that. The correct number is whatever it takes. Okay. Because and I use this, I, I try to use this framing a lot when I talk about like policy stuff, but um we have these debts that we have as, as humans and when we interact with the economy and the longer you wait to do the green transition, the costlier the consequences of not doing it are, right? So whatever the number is that you need to pay for and find the money for is what it takes. Because if you cannot grow enough food to sustain a population and you're just constantly ravaged by uh, kind of wildfires or extreme climate events, that is more costly, I assure you, than whatever it takes to, to build this out. So I'm just sort of making the suggestion here that when we think about the politics of Green New Deal economics, that we shouldn't let the trillion dollar multiples spook us into saying we can't afford it. Um, so the better way to think about it is the dollar costs are not important, but the real costs are important. Okay, so at the very get-go, when you talk about something like this, you have to ask what are our resource constraints because that is that is our binding constraint like the the, the rate at which we can do a, a transformation of the economy um and how far we can go depends upon the resources that we have you can't print resources you can print money but you can't print resources so that means you need like you need enough machines to to build the new type the windmills and the solar plants and all that but you also need administrative capacity like that's actually really important like you need institutions that can handle planning for change uh and if you if you have 40 years of like reaganomics you, you've got your administrative capacity so that's also a cost um so it's it's very important to be kind of organizing for uh the resource nurturing and and, and, and development and that's why i spent so much time up front talking about how it's not just manna from heaven it's it's something that we have to build and nurture workers they're a resource too. workers exactly and so um Right. Uh, and, you know, like a job guarantee piece is, is all important in that regard. Um, you know, anyone who says we should, you know, Im immigrants are the problem uh, is really short sighted because like, you know, that's 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 a free that, that that's a labor source, too. Right. Um, and so so there, you've got you've got material resources that you build and nurture. You've got labor, you've got technology and administrative capacity. And those are your true constraints. Um, there are also distributional costs. So, yes. Um, you know, you, get, you might have loss of income payments to extractive in industries like Zenith CEOs might get poor. Okay. That's a cost. Uh, rich nations must clean up their messes and finance the activities uh, for poor nations to develop uh, cleaner industries. So that's this idea that there's the kind of like global North, global South transfer of, of wealth. Although I don't want, I don't want us to think about like moving buckets of dollars between continents here because that's not what the transfer is it's 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 investment it's direct investment and it's 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 like it's a sharing of resources because the when we get fixated on the dollar barriers we we lose the game or, we're not watching the ball anymore or like just easing the intellectual property right them, for example and not like denying people access to technology yeah we want to license it the green new deal needs to be open source you know um if you want to like maximize uh, scale, and then you might have bosses who lose profit opportunities as as their workers kind of like leave the 
the you know kind of wage labor nexus and and maybe join a, a green jobs corps. So like those sorts of things are are costs and also distributional impacts. And I would I would sort of put the question to everyone thinking about this: Are these distributional impacts worth not doing a green new deal? And I say no. Um, I think that you got to think about the next couple generations of folks who are going to have to live with the consequences of the choices we make today, and they would want us to do this. Yeah. How do you connect with and talk to like union union folks who work in the trades who are like a Green New Deal is going to be a threat to our workers' jobs and stuff? How do you get those folks involved in transition projects? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the way that I approach it is I say there's there's a whole there's like several generations of of trade union work in building out the next generation of technologies and so we could we could focus on like salvaging like one pipeline today or we could embrace a politics that says we are going to go big and bold on climate investment and that's going to create a ton of prevailing wage jobs it's going to create a bunch of apprenticeship requirements and that's like a big lever that we can um uh a, really a stick that we can use to say this needs to be kind of labor led um sort of like a um a labor and climate alliance and i think that that's pretty compelling like when, when you put it in those terms they're kind of like no i'm, a, I'm about it you know because that's four, four or five projects on the horizon instead of like one and so i think that there's uh a vested a vested interest in that and a lot of the, a lot of like union members also believe in the stuff too just on the, on a sort of individual personal level. And so there's, um, I think there's a material appeal, but there's also kind of a shared, like we're in this together appeal. Yeah. Um, also, like having a big bag of money to play with is also helpful because it's not abstract yeah. anymore. Yeah. It's like, Hey, if we start, billion dollars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, like hundreds of millions of dollars in like an urban area, for example, like, which we do have, um, that there's like, the capacity to be like here's the public like interest that the people of portland have decided is worth investing in like, yeah here's the money now like you all have to like figure out how labor power and administrative power and like design works to like make that work um and so like mitch was saying before about kind of like how economics can't just be like as taken it's about like the reproduction the production and reproduction of society like those relationships shouldn't be, we shouldn't consider relationships to be stagnant and like that they will always be the same because they were, you know, the way that they were for decades or whatever. Like they have to change. And so we get the opportunity to change them. Yeah. Like recently I was, I was talking to some iron workers and they were like, yeah, our biggest, like our, our jobs are solar panels, you know? So like there's, there's a kind of, there's an immediate connection with that. And you see that also with like, you know, steam fitters and pipe fitters and that sort of thing. Did you have a question? I have a question. Would you consider big oil an institution? Yes. And so to what extent do we have agency to, um, to promote um, transition with the big oil? I'm thinking of like the, the major stockholders. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, save the question for the. Oh yeah. So the question uh, for folks on the call was, uh, do I consider big oil an institution? And I, I say yes. Uh, and so the follow-on question is, you know, what opportunities for maybe contest or changing that, like that preeminence? And whether we have, how much agency do communities have in mm. interacting with big oil, um, the transition? Yeah, that that is a, that's a it depends question. And so the way I'm going to put it is, is I'm going to say that if I go way back to this definition here. Um, there's a tension between like structure and agency, right? And so big oil has the benefit of structure because they've, they've been so powerful for so long. So they, they have both structure and agency simultaneously. And they, they, they're basically, um, they have like relative advantage in the whole agency game. Uh, communities don't, but we can. And so if we can organize in a mass politics sense and kind of say, Actually, you know what? The Zenith example is really good. And the CEI hub is really good because there was like something like 36 neighborhood associations in Portland that joined an event at Augustana Church on what, the 17th, 16th? And that cuts across the 
broad swath of ideological kind of and, and also economic slices of the city. And everyone understands that these trains are, are, are a hazard for our communities. And so there are opportunities to say, look, um, we can kind of come together and build a mass politics. And now we do have the same level of agency. And you no, know, you're not going to take them on at a national or international level from Portland, but you can kick them out of your town, right? You know, you can do do things like that. And so I think there's there's obviously that's it's more complicated than that, but it's complicated. That was the press conference where we presented the yeah. from the neighborhood association yeah. from the CEI task force. We haven't heard back from the politicians that it was uh, delivered to, or I, I haven't heard um, yeah. any updates on that. But last so I'm time, telling you what you already know. You you yeah. told me this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I can tell you they're on notice. Yeah. Although obviously without like a, a larger justice lane that is just going to displace it to someone who doesn't have the political power to deal with that. That's right. And that's, happened, continue yeah, okay. and that's why I think that like the appeal is for mass politics yeah. that kind of transcends community. Um, and it's like national in a sense or international. Uh, Ryan. Yeah. So you were just talking about the distributional <clears throat> uh, aspect of, of what was on the slide. This uh, one? Okay. Yeah. Um, do you think the prevailing like approach found in the IRA to like market financing the energy transition even has like a distributional idea in it? Like the, yeah. You said that we have legislation right now, like IRA. Are the powers that be even imagining that there's a distributional element or is there kind of like I've got a bunch on the IRA that I'm gonna talk about, but I'm glad but I'll answer your question right now. Um there the answer is yes, there is distributional stuff in the IRA. But I'm worried that people don't know that and we don't know how to use it because right now the Inflation Reduction Act, I think, is is kind of like not really rolling out in a very effective way. Um, but there's very strong like, labor uh, carrots in there. And um, and so kind of what I wanted to do tonight was to explain how we can kind of get creative with that, because if you can really sort of maximize the use of that provision, then that can be pretty transformational. And it goes to your question about like, how do you get labor on board? Inflation Reduction Act, do as many projects under that as possible. And you're going to generate a, a bunch of jobs. And, and that has a, um, a very like classical distributional impact from the economics. Like it's, it, it's a transfer from, it's, it's not necessarily a transfer from like, you know, the bosses to the workers in the sense as it is like from the federal government to workers, but it's still a transfer nonetheless. And it changes that relative um, uh, income share. Um, yeah, so I might, I might, you know, let's see, we're 625, wow. Okay, um, just wanna say real quickly here, um, the, there's this kind of quote that I like that says, look, when you're talking about how to pay for something, you first ask the question, is it technologically feasible? And if the answer to that is yes, then it's financially possible. It doesn't mean you automatically know how to pay for it, but it also means that like you can find the money for it through politics. So if it's technologically feasible, it's financially possible. And I'm, you know, I'm here to tell you that it is technologically feasible to transition to a completely clean economy. Like you will sometimes hear people say, well, no, you still need natural gas plants or you still need kind of coal plants. Few people say the coal plant thing anymore because it's kind of embarrassing but <laughs> but a lot of people still say the natural gas thing and they're dead wrong right it it might be the most convenient and the most kind of like practical from like a validating the existing balance sheets perspective but it is technically possible to solve all the balancing and peaking problems of the grid with um wind wind water and solar and other kind of like storage technologies um it might be expensive but you know, you organize for the money. Okay. And yeah, we're going to talk about money here for a little bit. Uh, I, I promise I won't spend the next hour talking about modern monetary theory, but I have to do a little bit of it here because <laughs> it is important. And um, so raise your hand either in the room or on the chat. If you've, if you know what MMT is or modern monetary theory. Okay. Uh, Stephanie's done a really good job. She's been a good evangelist. Um, Stephanie Kelton uh, wrote a book called the deficit myth. Uh, she was my professor in graduate school. 
it's like her, I created her Twitter account and now she has like 200,000 followers or something like that. But um, she still returns my calls. It's, it's cool. But um, but anyway, uh, she taught us that money is an institution, right? It's not this thing that you find. It's, it's not gold. It's not a commodity. It is a social relationship. And that's not just an MMT claim that, uh, you know, that's a longstanding like political economy claim. Even like mainstream normie economists in the middle of the 20th century used to understand that we just they got weird about it in, in the Reagan years. But um, it's a social relationship, right? It's it's this kind of like boundless kind of IOU relationship between between people and the state or or other institutions. And so if you're looking at the federal government as a whole, you look at a country like the United States uh, that issues its own currency, then it never faces like a solvency uh, constraint on its ability to create new money. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to go get the money before it spends because it creates the money. Like that's not true for the state of Oregon. That's not true for the state of Washington or even Greece. It's not true for member, member states of the EU, but it's true for the US. And so what I'm saying here is, is that while it's not concrete, while it's not like something you dig out of the ground, it's not gold, it's also not fake, right? So I used to get really bent out of shape when people would be like, oh, money's fake. I'm like, no, I get it. Uh, but stop saying that it's giving me psychic damage uh, because social relationships aren't fake, right? Institutions aren't fake. They're real, but they're, you know, it's not like concrete on the ground. Right. Um, so, uh, so what that means is that we can run deficits and we can do federal spending. So I, I'm, I'm kind of navigating a balance here between local action and praxis and, and understanding what's possible and what's probably not politically feasible at the federal level but it's important to kind of like get our grounding right on like how to pay for the green new deal because i'll probably say in a slide or two later you do need federal funding to do the green transition you can't do this at the level of a city or a state it's too expensive and we can't print money so you need to get the federal government on board there are things we can do here and now but our demands should always be sort of organizing around this idea that we should never let a federal politician tells us we need to balance the budget arbitrarily and as the primary objective uh, and as a consequence, forego doing investments like creating new infrastructure that enables a sustainable future, right? Um, so we're just, you know, I'll run through this really quickly. When the federal government spends, what it does is it creates a credit in your bank account, right? So if you're a social security recipient, the money shows up once a month and it's just direct spending from the treasury. Um, it's not constrained by tax receipts because those are two completely independent actions. Government spends on one cycle on some amount, it taxes in another cycle on some amount. And if it's taxing less than it spends, the deficit grows, right? <laughs> Excuse me. And so um, there's no solvency risk. Like you're not going to go bankrupt um, to the Fed, right? The dollars, uh, debts and dollars can always be met by federal spending. Um, we can get bent out of shape about the size of the debt, the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, last time I was in this room, I kind of used an analogy uh, and talked about the national debt clock in like New York City. And it's like, it just, the number goes up really fast. And you're like, oh my God, this is now, now my, now my, now my kid owes $200,000. What happened? I just, I just looked a second ago, it was 150. Oh shit. Now it's 300,000. Like this is insane. This is out of control. Uh, we've got to do something, but that's just like a sort of, um, that's, that's a, it's a powerful myth-making tool that makes us afraid to do things. Uh, the true, the true debt clock is, is every day we delay on like sunsetting the bad resources and building the good ones, right? That's the debt clock. It's the delay. It's the inaction. Um, and so it's legislation actually at the federal level that creates the funds to spend. So, so this is very much this idea that um, it is really, it is monopoly money in a sense. And that the banker here is saying, no, you can't afford it. It's like, no, you can always just write another token. So read the book. Um, it's a really good book. Uh, tell her I said hi. Uh, okay. So, uh, but there are, I'm not saying there's no limits. Like there are three mind, three, primary limits to, to federal spending. Uh, the first is inflation, right? So if you spend too much in a short amount of time on the wrong kind of stuff, you're going to generate inflation. Um, and I've got a few quotes uh, 
or I got a little thing from uh, Jay Powell, who's the chairman of the Federal Reserve. And you know, during the kind of second year of the pandemic, he's like, basically what we've realized is the the kind of trade off between unemployment and and, uh, and inflation is broken down. Like it doesn't, there's not a, a um, there's not a very well defined functional relationship anymore. Um, and that was a good that was good news for for people like me who've been kind of fighting the Fed for a long time on this. And it's like, great, abandon that. Like, let's go hard. Let's let's do maximum employment. And he was doing maximum employment for a little while, but he got he got spooked last year. So now he's raised rates and sucks. But that's where we're at. Uh, but but inflation, but we did experience some inflation during the pandemic because we had a shortage of real resources. So if you guys are old enough to remember, uh, well, everyone in here is old enough to remember it. But um, if you felt the pain of it, of the Great Recession, if you were out of a job in 2008 through 2012, um, you know, that that experience, that that recession and the and the, and the consequences of not doing enough um, resulted in us losing a bunch of resources. So there a bunch of plywood mills shut down in Oregon or consolidated and we lost some capacity not just in Oregon, but, but, but nationally. And so when everyone decided, Oh, I got to stay home. I got to rehab my house. I need a second home office. Uh, we didn't have enough plywood to, to, to mill. We didn't have enough milling capacity. So there was a real resource constraint. Um, right now we have a resource constraint on not enough like providers to, to scale uh, preschool as fast as we want to, but that's the consequences of past austerity. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that's the way we think about it. So inflation or resource constraints are this iterative thing that um, that are always there as maybe a, a potential check on spending. But the, the best way out of it is, is to sustain an investment plan and say, we're signaling that we are committed to this resource for the long haul and you, you will build the resources for it. Uh, the federal budgeting process, it's a mess. I don't even need to bore you with that. It's a tough nut to crack. I cannot imagine a Congress and a Senate and president that would do this in this world that I can think of today, but I'm not here to tell you we can't do it. I'm here to say we have to organize for it. So people were doing some of this stuff like three years ago. Like they started we, touching on it. We had a we had a minute. We had a moment. Uh, and I was like a little bit later. I'm like sometimes you get surprised by this. Um, and so the Overton window shifts, and it did shift a little bit, but then it closed up again. So I see that as an invitation to push again. Um, but I'm just kind of laying out the the uh, the politics are are tough. There there are some like MMT folks who are like, no, no, we just need to keep posting harder about it, and it's going to change. <laughs> I'm like, that's not going to happen. Um, but but I but I appreciate your your soldiering on. Uh, and then there's like a debt ceiling constraint, which is which is fake, which is totally made up. Okay, so yeah, this was this meme was like my life a couple of years ago, and so this. Uh, so this is still in the deck, but so what I'm saying here is like resource maintenance and constraints is always about investment. Like it, it's, if, if we feel like we have a shortage of resources today, that means we just, we didn't invest enough yesteryear. And if we, if we think that we want those resources tomorrow for the things that we want to do, you know, the, the best data to invest in it was yesterday. The second best time is now. Right. So this this idea that you have you have a kind of sustained investment view. And when I talk about politics or I talk about kind of like what are the economics of um of of, of change, it's it's always investment led. Okay. Um we we can decide that we want to run like uh, rapid transit in our city. That's good investment. It doesn't just fall out of the sky. We've got a we've got an operator here in the room. So you know. Um anyway. Uh, so it's always, you know, resource constraints. It's always about maintenance. It's always about investment and nurture. So it's like grow your garden, right? Um, so so again, you know, stepping back to rethink all this, like this is how you pay for it. Okay, I put this here in the end of this because, you know, yes, you know, money is a social relationship. You can print it. Um, you can at st state and local level, but you can get kind of, kind of get creative with some um, maybe alternative currencies or state banks or, you know, you kind of play with institutional design a little bit. But really the way you pay for change is through investing and creating new resources. So it's like a stewardship argument. Uh, and it reflects the way that we choose to organize our production, right? It's our value statements. It's our priorities. Um, 
yeah, we substitute a care economy for the violence economy. Uh, coming back to labor for a minute, um, the Green New Deal inherently will involve a lot of non-market labor, right? You, you have to have an opportunity um, to allow people to say, I want to spend my time. I want to spend my limited time on earth, literally sowing seeds or doing like environmental remediation work or working in like a green jobs core instead of like clocking into an office to like come up with a slide deck to pitch on how to do the jobs core. Like maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want to literally go out there into the forest and do some remediation work or, or, um, or, or whatever the kind of like the job entails. And so it's not enough to just financing it through a, an act of legislation. It's not enough to find the funds. Like you, you still need labor to do it, which means you have to guarantee people the right to directly participate in that. The market will not deliver enough jobs to do this. It might deliver some jobs, but there will always be a residual that the market doesn't pencil out on. Right. And that's not a dig at like capitalists. It's not a dig at people who are maybe nonprofit, um, uh, nonprofits that engage in kind of market adjacent activity. It's just, a, it's just a statement of fact that when you have to run a business, you have to cover your costs and some things don't pencil out. Okay. And so the, what's left here is like this, this residual of people who want to do that work, but can't find employment. Okay. And we actually suffer from this right now. Like we've got the tightest labor market we've had in the United States since, uh, I mean, at least, at least 50 years. Okay. And there are still people who can't find work and that's, that's racialized and it's, it's structured on like class and gender as well. And so there are certain broad kind of like justice aspects to this as well, both environmental justice acts, um, uh, aspects as well as uh, civil rights aspects to to the call for a job guarantee um job guarantee grew out of like the civil rights movement and so there's a tradition there uh and so in the green new deal what makes it like the green new deal and not um not the new deal again is is an inherent statement of a kind of a a, a justice aspect uh that's important to kind of recognize so uh one of my buddies uh raul uh uh he he wrote an article at one point I, sh I should have put in the syllabus and I'll do it. I'll like, I'll put it in the discord at, after the fact he wrote, he wrote a, uh, an article. I think it was, I'm going to paraphrase it here. Um, the, your government owes you a job and he makes the case that there's a legal, there should be a legal case to sue the government for not allowing you to have um, like access to a job guarantee. And it's an interesting argument. Um, so when we're designing this and we're thinking about how to pay for it, we need to think about labor and a big part of mobilizing the resource base is ensuring people who want to spend their time with their literal hands uh, and, 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 you know, brains and their kind of, you know, their, their time and their whole selves can contribute directly to the labor process. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I already complained about Congress. Um, it's, it's necessary to organize for it. It's it's not probably going to happen as fast as we want, but we we don't seed the ground is is kind of what I want to say on that. Um, so yeah, that that means we got to get creative. So there is like an ideal state. The ideal state is like giant green MMT state, right? Federal government. You can get the right people in office, and they're like, you know what? We're going to go hard. We're going to do this. Um, that's probably not the likely state. So we have to think about how we can get creative. Uh, with what I'm calling economic design. And this is like a, I read, my, my friend Yakov wrote a paper and it's in the syllabus and it's called the designer economy. And he kind of lays out this idea that like, you just try stuff, right? You, you kind of like, you look at your institutions and you see what you can get away with. And then you, you, you meddle around, you've got a plan in mind and you kind of do this iterative dance with like investment, policy design, administrative work, and if it works, great, build on it. If it doesn't, jettison it and go forward. And I kind of think that's how we have to think a, a little bit about um, uh, organizers and, and and kind of like policy analysts and um, as someone who, you know, we're, we're, we're in the city of Portland. We we are small in comparison to the problem, but we, we do have some opportunities, right? So 
uh, waiting for the big green MMT state. Like we we don't have time to sit back and wait for the right federal um, bureaucrats to help us do it. We have to act now and constantly. Um, and so I think that, you know, even second best policy uh, outcomes can open up meaningful action. And there's a couple that come to mind here that I've named. Uh, the Bipartisan Inf Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act, which, you know, Ryan kind of brought, brought up earlier. Um, I was surprised at how generous those are in historical comparison. I'm going to get into the weeds on the Inflation Reduction Act here in a second. Um, but I cut my teeth on all this stuff in the Great Recession period. And I remember how bad austerity was in those years. And the idea that we appropriated as much as we did, basically from March 2020 through these laws, still blows me away. Like, is it sufficient? No, absolutely not. But it is historic in scale. And so you can be surprised sometimes about the outcomes that can come out of policy. And so you shouldn't let those waste away. You should seize them and squeeze every uh, every ounce of opportunity out of it. And then I also put the Portland Clean Energy Fund here. And I, I didn't put that there because I'm surprised. Like Portland punches above its weight in climate organizing, but it is a big opportunity that we, we can think about as um, something we have fought for and won, something we can protect and steward, and then see how it can play along with some of this other stuff, right? Uh, and we can do our part. So Inflation Reduction Act. So show of hands, who who knows what this is already? Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So we've got some, we got a lot of hands. We've got some kind of maybes. Um, basically what happened in 2021 is like the Build Back Better plan failed. Uh, you've got the two senators that kind of like squashed it more or less. Um, but the Inflation Reduction Act kind of came out of that. And a bit of a surprise to a lot of us who were watching it. Um, and Joe Manchin was kind of like his, like, oh, we can do this much, I guess. We're not going to do Build Back Better, but we we can do we can do this other set of acts, which is like this energy transition piece. There's a lot to it, but I focus on the energy stuff. Um, and it's a it's a huge window of opportunity. It's it's a a limited window. There's a sunset on the credits, but it's uncapped in terms of its tax credits, right? And that's the piece that I think not everyone gets. Uh, so I'm going to describe how this stuff works, but there is no federal statutory limit on the amount that can be paid out from the federal government through eligible Inflation Reduction Act energy projects. So that's something we want to keep in mind for tonight. Um, and what's also very interesting and new, which makes it historic in another sense, is that for the first time, tax-exempt organizations to include you know, your nonprofits, if you're a 501c3 and you know how to pull it off, you can do this. But also state and local government can do this. Energy cooperatives can do this. Uh, you can now take advantage of tax credits. Because, I mean, the issue before was like, well, if you don't have a tax liability, how do you get a tax credit? It's meaningless. It's, it just goes to invest your own utility. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and you compare it like with other grants and fiscal tools. So there's like a whole library and alphabet soup of potential grants that can be used for um, climate and um, uh, kind of energy transition projects. You can pair Inflation Reduction Act credits with PCEF grants. If you can write the grant, pull it off. You know, so there's there's ways to kind of play in this milieu. Um, so what's in it? Uh, there's a whole host of different types of tax credits, but the ones that I think are most interesting for tonight um, are the investment and, and production tax credits for clean energy projects. So uh, the way it works is essentially you have to choose between one of the two. Um, if you want to get paid by like the amount of energy you generate, you want a tax credit for that, you say, I'll take the production tax credit. It's like dollars per megawatt hour. Um, or if you want to like get a big subsidy up front and say, you know, my, my power plant costs this, um, then you can take the investment uh, tax credit. And then it's just like a big, you know, grant to you uh, to, to kind of uh, uh, offset the costs. How are we doing? Do people, folks need a break? Or, Nick, how's it feeling here? Feel like it feels okay. Just kind of like if you want to just go to the bathroom and make some care. Okay. Because um, I'm in that like, in that wild man mode of the night <laughs> where I just don't, I don't even know where I'm at anymore. Um, but um, uh, so the way, so I, so I work 
I work as an energy economist. I work in this business. Um, and the way it works is like, you'll have, you'll have a solar plant or you have a wind turbine and you're like, okay, it costs, this is the capital cost. This is the permitting cost. This is kind of your upfront labor. And, and you kind of rack all that stuff up and then you figure out how to present it in like a present value sense. And then that gives you your kind of like feasibility condition. Like, does this pencil out or does it not? If it doesn't, you don't do the project. But in the Inflation Reduction Act, there's the potential to get anywhere between 30% of an investment tax credit or up to 70% an investment tax credit. And the range, the, the effective range there depends upon like specific edge cases, but that has a huge impact on investment. That that can really bring down like the break-even point um, substantially to where it's like what was no what was like a year ago not a feasible project now it is and now you say oh well that's interesting why aren't we doing this everywhere um that's what i'm going to try to convince you to do so here's a little table that kind of breaks this out so like i'm just picking on the uh, the investment tax credit and like let's just assume we're doing a solar plant here so and this gets to ryan's question earlier about um Sorry, I hope you don't mind me using your name. I just know you, so I'm just, okay. Um, it's there's a very strong labor uh, tool. Like the Inflation Reduction Act is really kind of like a backdoor um, pro labor thing, uh, and that also surprised some of us who were watching it because the way that it used to be was like the the base tax credit was was X, and it just didn't really matter what you're doing with prevailing wage labor. But in the investment tax credit, the base credit is really low and weak, 6%. 6% is nothing. Th who cares? It's not even worth the paperwork to file for, right? Maybe it is. I don't know. But but, but here, when you were comparing it to like, if I meet the labor requirements, now I get 30%, that's that's real money. So if I'm if I'm looking at a, a project, like a, you know, maybe it's like an offshore wind project, and that's, and that's very expensive. And you're looking at maybe a project in the billions of dollars. 30% off of a billion dollars is $300 million. That's real money. And so, so now you're, you're evaluating this from the standpoint of like, okay, well, maybe I should try to hit the labor requirements. You've now sort of like bullied an investor into saying, well, I'm going to get, I'm going to get prevailing wage labor. So it's going to be unions. And I'm going to make sure that um, we're meeting their apprenticeship requirements. Unions love that shit. Like that's, that's their whole bread and butter. And so a lot, that's, that's why, that's why they like the inflation reduction act. And that's also why we have an opportunity, like as like climate um, planners and activists to say, we should try to do IRA projects because it's going to be a big boon to, to labor. Uh, so that's, that's right there uh, as the first stage gate. And I, and I, I don't even, so if I went back and I, pre I presented the range, I don't even bother with 6%. No one's going to take the 6% credit because you're not, you're going to lose money if you, if you skip out on the, on, on the labor multiplier. So 30 is really the, the, the bottom of the barrel here. Um, and then there's another one, which is like, you got to get, you know, if you get another 10%, if you meet the domestic content requirements. So that's like sort of a build America, buy America provision. Um, it's it's necessary for like the, the elective pay provision, which is like how you get it if you're tax exempt. And so in a sense, it's 40%, not 30%, which is your lower bound. Um, and then, this is the interesting part. Like if you're in an energy community, you get another 10%. So what is an energy community? Well, this is a place where like you used to have a dirty power plant or there used to be a fossil fuel um, project. And so I'm thinking about, okay, what can we do in Portland? What would be an energy community? Well, the CEI hub is an energy community, is it? You know, so, so you think about that and it's all defined upon census tract um, designations, but like if it has been used for fossil fuel, processing or production um that's an energy community um so that's another 10 percent. so like you're at 50 now okay uh and then there's environmental justice bonus credits too so if the project happens in a low income zip code or census tract or it's in a sort of tribal uh community then that's another 10 percent uh and if the project is like one of these kind of like it's a very specific type where it's like you do a residential residential building uh, that has the majority of its economic benefits. Well, the reason why you're doing the building is like to create jobs in a low-income community, essentially. And so I think about, okay, well, you could do like a social housing project on the east side of Portland. That would probably fit this designation. 
that's 20%. So you can go from, you can get up to 70% if you can design a, a use case that maximizes IRS. So if you take 70% as your starting position, you're like, okay, well, my project was going to be $10 million. Who wants to pay for that? Well, now it's $3 million. That's so, meaningful. So you're saying like, just as like a hypothetical, you'd be like, build social housing with like a big solar and battery yeah. array yep like next to linton somewhere and it's just like mm -hmm. oh, okay like 10 million dollar project is three million and so basically yeah. all you have to do is like go and find the three million dollars up front to be able to construct exactly $10 million property. yeah i'll just like shortcut to this little diagram that's kind of what i what i was thinking when i made this slide is like you could have you could you could sort of think about well, actually, let me come back to this because now I got myself out of order because um, I was like, if you're using a revolving fund, but but that's the basic idea, Nick, is you you think about your your grant that you would get normally through a, like a, a budgeting process like this. Um, you would have to cover that project with the whole grant and that I'm thinking about that as like you're eating your seed corn, whereas you could say that's your equity position in this project. But now the IRA is is floating another part of it. And then you could get like favorable financing and then you can make this like, you could really stretch those grant dollars out quite a ways. This is kind of where I'm going with that. Um, so there's huge opportunities to like do more than what we normally would have done in the past by kind of like leveraging stuff. So I laid out in it, I did some economics, I actually did economics for an economics lecture. Um, I did some like math uh, last night. So I laid out an example project. So let's say you have like 150 megawatt solar community solar array that's a, that's pretty large for, for this use case but um you could go lower and it, it, the math's pretty much the same uh you assume that there you use public financing so you're issuing tax exempt debt right um and then you if you take all those costs and you levelize it which is just a way of taking the lifetime costs which are lumpy and have weird shapes over 20 years and you just bring it into a, a single number that can be represented in a, a dollar per megawatt hour Typically, that type of project would be $43 a megawatt hour without the subsidy, right? Um, you see power purchase power purchase agreements in the wholesale market for about $45, 45 to 60 for a project like this. Um, the base kind of like lowball estimate here with public financing would be 43 bucks without the subsidy. If you take the IRA elective pay credit, and don't worry, I'm going to define elective pay in a second, um, using the ITC, then that that becomes anywhere between 24 and 32 bucks a megawatt hour. So that's a mass, you're already in the money considerably on that. And so I just want to put this in terms of scale for like, because we don't, most of us don't think in terms of dollars per megawatt hour wholesale market. What the hell does that mean? We, we look at our electric bill and we know what our rate is, right? Uh, does anyone know what the current posted PGE rates are? It's $20 a kilowatt hour, roughly. That's... You know, you divide by a thousand here. So, so this this is two point four to three point two cents per kilowatt hour, in in the project cost. PG rates are twenty dollars per kilowatt hour. All right. So you know, PG pays for a lot of other things. It pays for their over all their overhead costs, their system, um, Maria Pope's salary and stock options. You know, like there's all that. There's shareholders to pay. Um, so it's a little bit of an unfair comparison. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is like if PGE as a utility it says, you know what, $43 is the price that we would accept in, in the wholesale market, then if we can go out under IRA and do a project for 24 to 32, that's affordable. That's how you pay for it. And that, that's like a sort of like, that's a small piece, but it's something we can do. And I said earlier that these credits are uncapped, which means that we're basically limited only by like, how hard we can push like the city of Portland or Metro regional governments. Do I define eligibility here? No, right, right here. Um, so who can do this? It's not just investor owned utilities, like elective pay or direct pay allows for like the tax credit to become like a payment straight from treasury for what we call qualifying entities. And so as defined in the law, any state and local government instrumentality. So that's the state of Oregon. That's a county that is uh, the regional government, metro regional government. So TriMet potentially could be doing IRA projects, school board. 
Um, what'd you say? What's the PDC called now? It's like yeah, Prosper. Is it Prosper, Prosper Portland? Um, so yeah, any instrumentality of the state, tribal entities, uh, energy cooperatives, which we have in the state, which we have in Washington and this whole region, uh, public utility districts. We don't have one in Portland, but we, you know, you've got McMinnville as a public utility or some municipal uh, PUD. Um, across the river, you got Clark Public Utility District. So we've got a lot of these public utility districts in the region. And 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 the language also says and other tax exempt organizations. So basically everyone, except for Bonneville Power Administration and uh any of the other power marketing agencies, they're left out for some reason. Um that's all right, they don't want to do it anyway. You're recording this. Whatever. This is uh this is not their statement, this is mine. Um anyway. Uh, but what I'm saying is like, there's a lot of these entities that have the administrative authority to take elective pay credits. And if you can get creative and then realize, oh, I can, I can develop energy projects, then you can do it and you can get paid for it. So that's the part that I think we don't want to shortcut. It's like, just cause you can get a credit from the government doesn't mean you know how to do it. Like it would be kind of hazardous and maybe a little bit foolish for like, someone to just file art articles of incorporation to create a, a 501c3 and then immediately get into the, the resource development game without a lot of thought to how to kind of staff that and like do that stuff. But, but a city can, a regional government can. And the reason why I say they can is because they have experience engaging in project finance. They know, they know how to put together a budget to look at a pro forma. They know how to kind of issue debt and to look at like what kind of a revenue stream looks like they they have contract experience and this is all about contracting at the end of the day and so um so basically like capping like pisa right now while this these provisions over is like basically like mass financial insanity because you're just like yeah there's like 80 cents to the dollar of like free money for the city of portland to like invest in yeah. like all sorts of like housing and energy projects and you're just like nah we don't feel like taking the free money because some downtown business guy is that's the way i think about it <laughs> yeah that's a yeah ryan yeah yeah they what i can tell you I, I know i know that the the private sector is looking very closely at ira um i know that investor owned utilities are looking at it and like bond like municipal bond market rating agencies are looking at it and what you need to understand about this cohort of of money guys is that they're inherently risk averse and conservative. And so they're like, who's the first mover here? So no one really wants to kind of go out and start going hard on this because uh, there's still a little bit of uncertainty as to whether or not, like there's some particulars in the tax code that are being ironed out. Um, and, uh, but I, but you know, you're going to see, you're going to see investor owned utilities do these projects. They're, they're gonna it's gonna be in their um, integrated resource plans for sure um whether or not they're gonna say well we can bet on the 70 percent that's probably not what they're gonna do because they're not gonna say well i'm gonna target my investment to to meet all of the bonus credits instead they're gonna assume that they can't meet the bonus credits and so they're gonna do the project finance economics at 30 percent not 50 or 60. whereas what we can say as a public is this, um is to plan for it is, is to intentionally target that type of investment. We can say, well, you look at the Portland Clean Energy Fund, which has an energy justice mandate. Um, you can pair really well and say, well, here's an idea. In fact, this slide's a good, um, good, good opportunity to talk about this. Is we could say, all right, we're going to write a grant for PCF um, that capitalizes a, a revolving fund, okay, and then the revolving fund makes the equity investment in the project. And it provides the 20% you basically need. Um, the project uh, gets underway. It retard, it, you know, you set a price on it, like you figure out the economics such that you can return a little bit of that equ equity back to the revolving fund and replenish its source. So you can scale and do another project. Um, 
and then the value the value flows back to the city uh at least indirectly or it's you know direct to the inhabitants of the of the project that you that you built or the community tenants or whatever um but that's still an asset of the city it's a public resource now um and you got to the 60 or 70 percent edge case because that was the plan that the city went out and did the city takes risks all the time on questionable economics i mean that's people are griping about that and there's you know good good governance arguments to be honest about there um but we but I would I would say that leaving money on the table, not only federal credits, but also just like not maximizing the impact of a potential like huge multiplier is also bad governance, you know. Um, but I've got this slide up here because it's 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 applicable not just to like the IRA and the energy project idea, but also wanted to think about a little bit about social housing and kind of housing policy broadly. I mean, there are there are models in the past where you would sort of you fund directly through a low income housing tax credit or some other funding stream to to pay for the kind of project cost, which only goes so far. Um, new thinking on this, like some cities like Chicago, Atlanta, Montgomery, Montgomery County and, and Maryland, they're starting to say, well, rather than have a direct kind of relationship with the tax base or the, or the grant base, we're going to use it to capitalize a revolving fund that creates the the initial equity investment in the project and then you do normal project finance you float bonds like you borrow for that sure um and you you layer on your your whole capital stack for your project just the way you would but the equity investment from the revolving fund means you get your your, your hurdle rates lower which means that you can you can realize a little bit of a spread there so you can still have an affordable housing project and you can also create a revenue stream that replenishes your revolving fund. And so it's almost like a magic money tree, not the same way as the federal MMT lens, but it's it's this idea that if we get creative and think about what we have the statutory um, ability to do, uh, then there's there's room to play around here and, and kind of like expand our solution space a little bit. So I'm just gonna pause there and see if there's like questions or if people are confused. Um, I'm going to go Nat, then, then Ryan. When does the IRA expire? I think uh, 2033. There's only opportunities there. there there's, I, I am almost certain that there will be um, a law that will update it one way or the other. It could go the other way. It could be repealed. Uh, and that's also part of like what the private sector is grokking with right now. It's like, yeah, if you can get it in the ground now and claim it soon, sure, you've got it because the investment tax credit's a lump sum which is nice, which is why most people will take the investment tax credit over the production tax credit. But um, you could have a bad outcome and get a bad Congress that just repeals it. So that's always a risk. Um, Ryan. What does the revolving part of revolving fund? Yeah, the question uh, from the room was, what is the revolving part of the revolving loan fund uh, referred to? And it's this idea that when you think about the seed capitalization, like the the initial funding act, whether it's from the city of Portland or it's from Metro government, or maybe it's a federal grant, um, you think about it as just seeding a fund, uh, but the project, the performance of the project replenishes the fund. So you do, you're not depending upon an annual appropriations from the city budget necessarily to do all these projects dollar for dollar. What you're saying is that you stand up a fund that's like a mini bank uh, that makes makes an investment that gets a return on that investment over and above its cost, so it can do it again. So it's revolving and it kind of wash. It sort of recycles the the revenues that way. Sorry, I wasn't. Sorry to everybody on the stream. I was doing a really bad job of tracking questions before, and uh, oh, I, I sorry. I know there's frustration about not even hearing everything, but there is one question about like how the equity and justice portions of the IRA are um, insured. And then the second question is um, basically, I think it was a question around like biodiesel projects, but basically like aren't false solutions kind of like allowed under this umbrella too? Yeah, those are really good questions. So um, the first one is the way that you evaluate the energy justice um, prov provisions are, are based upon census 
track designations. So this the census ultimately determines whether or not a project is eligible for that. So like um, the kind of energy, um, the low income, the historically disadvantaged kind of low income designation will be a, an artifact of the census data. So it's really a geographical siting issue. Um, there is a, uh, if you do a, the project proposal and you say, I am doing this kind of residential building project that has an economic benefit, there's going to be some reporting requirements. So there's, there's a series of like administrative tests and, and hoops to jump through, which is probably another reason why you won't likely to see a lot of that from the private sector. Um, and then the second question was, are there ways to, um, greenwash or sort of like get out of the binding? Yeah, I think there's like. Basically, the question is getting at in the IRA, there's a lot of um, allowances for projects that maybe folks in this room wouldn't consider to be like yeah. renewable and sustainable, like so that's setting or that's Joe like Manchin biofuels. So, this, like this, yeah, this, so the, um, this is a less than perfect bill. And the only reason it's got passed was Manchin was basically like, you need to strip out, you need to make these tech neutral. And we're going to make them tech neutral based upon like carbon embodiment measures. Uh, and there are also, um, you know, there's like renewable natural gas subsidies. Like there's all sorts of like problematic tax credits in here. Uh, the, the tax credit I've been describing thus far is really about just the, um, the energy neutral or the technology neutral uh, clean energy projects, uh, solar, wind, and, and, and and that sort of thing. But yeah, it, it's totally possible that you're going to see investments from IRA that um, kind of skirt around the intent, uh, which is why, you know, later in the slide, if I've got presentation, I've got, if I've got time, uh, I, I do make an appeal that it, it's none of this is a substitute for regulation, like, and using the kind of like policing powers of the regulatory state to ensure that we get the outcomes that we want, um, which I might as well just move on. Let's see. 7, 709. Um, last thing here, and I've kind of already touched on this, is like when we think about this designer economy theme and like getting playful and the uh, getting creative, we should be thinking about holistic and complementary investments. So uh, it goes beyond traditional energy projects. I'm thinking like, you know, transit oriented development, social housing that kind of pairs well with like, an, you know, um, a carbon kind of like carbon minimizing uh build um makes possible transit expansion and you know non-car centric design so i've got a very urbanist frame that i'm thinking through here but you can apply this in like a, a rural ses sense too but but the idea is like don't think about um these investments whether they're kind of leveraged through ira or some other kind of like technique as one-off projects but but how does it how does it build on and add to plans for holism uh and complementarity like you don't want to make an investment that blocks or foregoes the opportunity or makes more costly the opportunity to do something else that's also carbon abating, you know? So uh, probably don't need to convince anyone in this room on like uh, 15 minute city stuff. Um, mm -hmm. um, all right. So I've been talking a little bit about like playing inside of the space that you have, but then also sometimes you got to get kind of big and weird. With it. So I've got a couple of quotes from some of the dead white guys here, but, you know, Mark says the tradition of all dead, dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. That's sort of this idea that we get handed down these institutions and sometimes we have to like recognize that that's there and we have to jump over and break. Um, even John Maynard Keynes, he says like the difficulty lies, you know, new ideas are easy to come by. It's just the hard part is escaping from our old ones. It's so the old myths that we have a hard time jettisoning. Um, and then the, the wordiest dude in, in, in economic history is uh, this guy, Thorsten Veblen. Uh, and he said, and I just, I just love it. Uh, he's, so, he's so bizarre. He basically says, like, if institutions ever had a place and use in the human economy, they have in time grown imbecile and mischievous by force of changing circumstances. So he's saying, like, they might have been useful before. But now they're get, getting in your way and he likens it to like, you know, it's like a, a, a war, right? So it's like, you know, if, if a man loses a ward off the end of his nose, he does not apply to the ersatz bureau for a convenient substitute. It's like, <laughs> it's just gone, right? And so you just move forward. So what they're all trying to say is um, don't get locked in the past. 
uh, and yes, operate in the set of institutions you have, but sometimes you have to kind of like break from that and try to go big and radical and, and get a little weird. Um, and so uh, I, I say, you know, increment, incrementalism might sometimes be a practical necessity, but it shouldn't be an ideal. Like you sh it should not be sort of the organizing principle, like, oh, we should always just minimize change. Uh, Cause if you do that, you're like trying to save the war, right? Um, it can be painfully slow and it, it, all, it can also be suicidal. Like it can really undermine our ability to like do the climate investments we need to in time. Um, and so sometimes you gotta, you gotta plan for big dramatic leaps forward. So that's Veblen. That's the guy with the, the wart quote. I put laser eyes on him because I was in a whole mood uh, a couple of years ago. I think we all were. Um, I was also, I used to be really online. Um, I am now, but I don't tweet the same way anymore. Um, I'm getting trouble. Uh, yeah. So you just got to choose the right institutions for the challenge, you know? So you got sleepy poo. He's like carbon markets, uh, decarbon decarbonizing markets through codes and standards. Now that's interesting. Right. Uh, and so I actually really like the idea of stepping back and saying, okay, we're doing investment. We're going to get weird. We're going to do some new stuff. But we're also going to use the bully stick of the regulatory state as often as we can in the ways that we can. Um, and I came up through like environmental economics, kind of mad at the discipline because it wanted to rely upon the market to change our ecological harms. And my and economists hate regulatory uh, action. They, they would describe it as being like um, creating deadweight loss in a market. It creates a sort of inefficient outcome. It's better to have carbon prices. It's better to have incentives that are market driven. You know, that, that's an argument you can make. But the other side of that is that if you want to stop it and you want to avoid those, you know, how do we weasel around it? Like the question that came up inside of like the IRA context is like, well, is there a way to kind of like skirt it a little bit? And if you want to stop that, you have to have a strict regulatory stance. And you say, um, you're not allowed to do this and we will fine you. We will revoke your charter. Like that's, that's the hard case. I don't think we can really revoke charters that well. I mean, I don't know, maybe Nick has an opinion on this. I'm sure he does, but, but that's the threat. So when we think about the policing power of the state, it's the regulatory state that I say, you know, let's go hard on. But um, it's also true that market solutions are regulatory regimes in disguise, but that's a whole other lecture. I don't need to drag you through, uh, but, but codes and standards are really effective at shaping resources. Like, in the 1980s, well, the 1970s, like had the environmental movement, uh, the Department of Energy was created out of that. Um, you had a bunch of like a patchwork of regulatory codes and standards that created a market transformation. So you saw things like investment in um, weatherization for homes, uh, we, you know, through Energy Star standards, like federal, state, and local uh, code books. We've seen... Um, we've seen like savings in terms of efficiency gains because of that. It wasn't the market. It was the codes and standards and then the market responded. Um, and that's really powerful. And if you look at like California energy, like, I don't know if anyone follows that, but the renewable portfolio standard in, in California is a shining example. And I, you know, pun definitely intended because they overbuilt a bunch of solar. Um, it's just like shiny, right? Um, sorry. Uh, but that was like one of these things where it's like economists are like, you don't do that. That's bad. You a renewable portfolio standard. You've distorted the market. Now they've built too much solar. And it's like, this is fantastic. Great it's a great problem to have. Um, and it also, what, what it did was it, it accelerated the pace of that development. Right. So they, they sunsetted some natural gas plants. We saw a bunch of early retirement of coal and natural gas plants, not just in California, but in places like the mountain Rockies, Washington state, Oregon, because California built too much solar and it, it created the situation where it destroyed the market in a sense for wholesale prices, which meant these plants no longer had. Yes. So these, so, so we did, there was a regulatory action that said you will meet this portfolio by this date or you're screwed. And that's, that's extremely powerful. Does it distort the market? Sure. But markets again are just institutions that we use to organize our economy. This is another way too. Um, and by the way, just just stepping back to defend California a little bit, like they they did go through a period in the 2010s where they overbuilt a little, a lot of solar, which then 
did bring online some pretty dirty peaking plants, sometimes oil burning plants to kind of handle the ramp rate. But then California did more regulatory action. They said, well, batteries now need to have a place in the, the um, resource stack from the California ISO. You need to figure out a way to integrate this. Um, and they've done that. And so batteries have now shaved those peaks and, and batteries are now so solving the kind of intraday um, or within day storage problem. And so um, it's not what any utility industry person would have ever wanted, but the outcome has been good for the climate. And it has created a situation where uh, the cost curve for solar has come way down and it's created a, a model. So, so I say that um, strict regulatory action is very effective at, at kind of moving you to a different system state. Um, but at the local level, like we can get creative with like franchising and permitting tools. Like if you don't want a dirty polluter running oil trains through your backyard, revoke their permit. If you can pull it off, I think we can. Um, there's a couple people in this room that want to, but, uh, or you can like, if, if you want your local utility to, um, to make investments that, that results in a more resilient grid and distribution sim, uh, system, uh, kind of, you know, uh, organize around the franchising uh, legal framework that gives them the opportunity to, to operate or the permission to operate in the first place. Because all utilities derive their authority as natural monopoly through through franchising rights. Can I um, tell a funny story? Yeah. So um, I'll try to speak loud enough for the computer, but I worked in the city of Portland for Chloe Daily briefly for about six months. And we were... Um, advancing like 100% renewable energy policy. And it was like non-binding resolution, setting out, you know, trajectory for policy. And we had all these meetings with utilities and uh, they were trying to bully us around and they were like, you're not being a good partner, you're being so mean, you give all this money to charity, why are you being mean to us? And just like laying on like a weird guilt trip thing and, and then kind of trying to flex a little bit. And <laughs> we, a guy who's no longer at the city more named michael armstrong who was like the sustainability head at the city <laughs> like made a joke about threatening to revoke the charter of pacific power in the city and the lobbyists like went back in their chair like visibly what? because he basically like put the nuclear option on the table and he was like you know in a joking way but it's like the stakes are that like even though at, basically everybody that works in government just thinks that their job except john who's awesome um, thinks it's their job to basically like listen to what market actors tell them what their demands are. But the state, whether it's like local governments or state governments actually does have a ton of power. Yeah. They just don't use it because they've been sort of like bullied out of it over, you know, fights in the eighties and they went to schools that told them they weren't able to do it and all the rest. But there, there are a ton of tools that we can like, like Mitch says, just regulate how we want to. There's some things we can't do. We'll talk about this in the next two weeks, but um, like Mitch says, it's like, if you get creative, if there's five doors and four of them are closed for whatever legal reason, you still might have a fifth door to go through. Um, and so not just like running away from a fight at the first, uh, instance is always important. Yeah. And somewhere I've got a little quote by, um, our favorite flight, flight attendant, um, Sarah Nelson. Uh, and she said, you know, using power builds power. So if like you got that one door and you're like able to flex hard in that door and you get a win, then that would be a move second door. So I kind of like to think about political power is not a finite resource either. It's something you also invest in and sustain. Yeah. Special preemption and working to that. So is that a piece of that? So we think we're making all this progress at the local level and you know at the state level and then the feds come in and the I'm going to defer yeah, that. I'm going to kick that to my my legal advisor. Yeah, I think yeah. It's, it's I I'll have like a bunch of slides to talk about that next week. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Call my attorney here. Um, oh yeah. Why do they care so much about the type of generating source that they? Well, they do. They do generate electricity. They do. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the utility. Um, 
they there was some deregulation in the 1990s which opened up a bunch of like merchant power producers uh to like be not utilities but buy and sell on the grid but like every grid so for the northwest that's the bonneville power administration's grid and then there are like different balancing authorities inside of that portland general or pacific core has one um seattle city light has one uh, in California, you got Portland, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. They they got one. They all are required to to balance the load, and they also own a fleet of generation as well. And and, and they own they own transmission. Um, but even if they didn't, they still care. Uh, well, the load serving entities have an obligation to plan for for reliability and and and, and um and resource adequacy, and so. They're not like vested in a, they're not ideologically vested in a particular technology. What they don't like is being told what to do. And they, utility planner mind is is really, really conservative. Not in the kind of Democrat versus Republican sense of the word, but just really risk averse. And like, I, when I, you know, 20 years ago when I started my career, we just didn't do it that way. We've tried, we just didn't do, we, we've just never done it this way. And that's just a sort of, um, industry planner mindset that is really not just, it's not peculiar to the utility industry, although it's pretty prevalent. It's everywhere in a kind of like going concern. It's just kind of how business people think and, and bureaucrats and middle managers think um, when there's like an angry public and shareholders to answer to, right? And so you, you go with what you know. Um, and if you're a utility planner, you know that you can turn a gas plant on and off at will. So you like that. Right. Can I tell another story? Yeah, you can tell as many stories. Like war story now, and <laughs> like probably wasting my content from next week. But um, right around the same time that Portland was, um, and actually one of the reasons why we were like advancing policy around clean energy in 2017, partially because the Trump administration took over and it was like important to like localize some of this climate work. But um, PGE was trying to build gas peaker plants and baseload plants, I think, to replace the retiring Boardman coal plant. Yeah. And that served you to, it wasn't in Portland, the generation was out at Boardman, Oregon, but it would serve power needs for Portlanders through PGE. And a bunch of people in Portland in the region didn't want that to happen. And so um, we basically like had a huge fight through the city of Portland at the Public Utility Commission with PGE. So they were like activists, the city and the county versus, uh, because we had better political leadership at that time versus uh, PGE. And we like beat the shit out of them <laughs> in a place where we had like no business winning on the like sort of legal grounds, just based on like political power and using the bully pulpit. And it was such a devastating loss for PGE that was in that mindset that Mitch is talking about where they're like, we're just going to do what we want to do because we've always done it. And who are these clubs to tell us what to do? Yeah. That the institution actually fired their executive director and like got rid of them and like hired a bunch of like deep decarbonization people in the institution. And so like, yeah. sometimes you just have to fight. Like that's the, actually the answer is like do politics and like put your side up against theirs. And like, you can't get to the next stage if you, unless you win the initial battle, because otherwise you'll just be always getting things dictated to you and always be scared that somebody's going to come down on you. Yeah. Uh, so like last thing I want to say formally for the presentation uh, is I want to close by like talking about a little bit about the, gr the growth and degrowth and kind of, you know, literature debates. Um, We're actually have like are we, no time. We have no time. Okay. Just, in in like in 30 seconds, I want to say that this discourse, if you follow it, in my opinion, is more heat than light. And and I say this because the degrowth advocates are not advocating that we sort of like uh, eschew all technology and sort of go back into like the Stone Ages. Um, they're saying that we need to intentionally, we have to move past markets do whatever it takes, change our institutions to be sustainable. And that might involve, that definitely involves like a drawdown in certain economic activities. Fair. And I agree with it. The supply side industrial planning folks say it a different way in, in, a, in a pretty snotty way. Um, but, but their argument is like, 
well, you need to grow to create resources to make possible this transformation. And so I think this is an unsettled issue. I, I don't like that there's tension between these camps. I think it's counterproductive for the movement. Um, there are bad actors, I think, in the right side of my slides here that don't give good faith or are, are not working in, in good faith with like the degrowth camp. Um, some of it's like differences in disciplines, degrowths, uh, degrowth advocates are oftentimes like from the humanities or social sciences and are more interdisciplinary and the supply side industrial planners are technocrats, but there's a lot of common ground here. And I don't really have much time to, you know, more time to say more than that, but I wanted to kind of tease that out a little bit. So don't try to pin me in one of these camps. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually think there's a synthesis here that's worthwhile exploring and maybe next time I will, but I'll just, um, I'll leave you here with, uh, I appreciate your attention tonight. I know I said a lot of words and I didn't really take a pause. I missed the chat, so I apologize for that, but uh, it's been a lot of fun and um, I look forward to kind of talking to, to folks about this stuff in the future. Yeah, sorry about the chat. We'll get better next week, I promise. Um, one of our more responsible members of Breach Collective was not here to help me and I'm not responsible. So my bad. It's Nick's uh, fault. It's Nick's fault. <laughs> right, angry emails to Nick and uh, ask for a refund. Ask for a refund. And for folks who are here, if you wanna, if you have the time and you wanna keep talking, we can like go to a bar next day or get a beer and, and keep chatting a little bit. Um, but yeah, uh, I I saw a bunch of notifications, so people are using the Discord. Hell yeah! And we can kind of like follow up on some of these ideas that Mitch threw in there throughout the week, hopefully, and and just kind of keep the discussion going until we're back. I'll join I'll join the Discord, and you guys can ask me questions. So, thanks, Mitch. All right, thank you. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah.